Okay, welcome everybody to the second Information City Lecture of the, um, of the year. Uh, last week in my introduction, I explained how we changed the name of the lecture series from the Digital Divide Lectures to the Information City Lectures. Really, I could sum this up as being that we want to emphasize a citywide and a coordinated focus on what continues to be very persistent digital divides in town and beyond. But this week, I want to briefly mention two of the founders of InfoCity and some of the other people that are joining in. Um, one of them is Chris Hamm, who you'll meet in a coming up lecture. He is a Gisless grad who has a web development firm that serves, among other people, African American uh, community institutions and businesses. So he's well entrenched in the community. And the other is Brian Bell, who has single handedly recycled computers for the past few years that he's gotten from local businesses and other organizations and also taught digital literacy classes. So the two of them are uh, key community partners who helped to found this, to take this information city from being an idea to being a real partnership that is growing and other, other organizations are joining. Um, and they'll tell you more about that when they get here in a few weeks to give their digital information to the lecture. Um, today we are introduced as always by a student from Community Informatics. This week it's Julie Petrella, Julia Petrella. She's a PhD student here at Gisless, and she's going to introduce our three speakers who are here today. Thanks, Julia. They can hear you just fine through that microphone. <laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. Um, our three presenters today are all graduates of the Community Informatics program here at Gisless, as she said. Um, I would like to introduce Will Kent, who received his bachelor's degree in anthropology and Latin American studies from Tufts University in 2008 and graduated from Gisless with a certificate in community informatics in 2011. Since graduation, he has worked as a cyber navigator for the Chicago Public Library, headed up a social media initiative for the Illinois College Advising Corps, worked in social media and marketing for a grading app startup called Gradable, and is currently the e-resources reference and instruction librarian at Loyola University. Will presented at eChicago in 2012 and 2013, and he sits on the board of the Chicago Writers Conference. He is an avid bike commuter, and in his free time, he geeks out over internet culture and fashion's adventures through neighborhoods across the city. Hi, Will. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to introduce, introduce Brooke Bonson, who is a 2008 graduate of Gisslitz. Brooke is the Outreach Services Manager for the Cook Memorial Public Library District, located in Libertyville and Vernon Hills, Illinois. She enjoys working with a diverse group of patrons, including preschoolers on the bookmobile, Spanish-speaking community members, and seniors with the Homebound program. Brooke reads a wide variety of books, is a huge Pearl Jam fan, and enjoys trying new technology. I would also like to introduce Ed Remus, who currently works as a full-time adult librarian at the Edgewater branch of the Chicago Public Library. In addition to the master's from Gisless, he also holds a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of Illinois. Since 2008, he has worked as a high school librarian, community librarian, computer center assistant, cyber navigator, children's librarian, and adult librarian. He has had five library-related employers and has served seven distinct library locations. That's a lot. Um, Ed's other interests include social theory, modern history, and left politics. Thank you. Great. It's really great to have you all here, and we're going we're gonna to soldier through this novel technology we're using. And I think it makes sense to go in just the order that Julia introduced the three of you. So that means Will first, and then Brooke, and then Ed. And I, I'm, like I said, I'm going to be timekeeper so we can get to the discussion part of the time together. So go ahead, Will. Uh, Diamond, to talk about what I do every day? <laughs> Please. Okay. Uh, well, hey, everybody. I hope you hear me. I hope it's not choppy. Uh, the connection's been a little weird over here. Um, but as Julia said, I, I work at Loyola University now, um, and I'm the instruction and reference librarian. I'm, I'm also in charge of e-resources, which keeps me really busy. We've got something like 400 databases, electronic resources, e-journals, uh, weird subscription softwares that we use. It's my job to make sure that we have access to all of those. Um, and then I do regular reference duties. And I'm also a lead on to some of the, the hard sciences like uh, chemistry and nursing. And I also work with the first year students and like a whole host of other types and varieties of students and faculty. And so in addition to like the regular uh, website stuff and reference desk stuff, uh, I also put together uh, instruction sessions. 
And so those classes really do pay off. Definitely stick with those. Um, and they all have really different requirements. So I do like intro to nursing courses, and then I also do stuff for the free writing. Uh, and then I put together a host of workshops around uh, things that professors request and students request, things that I think are really important, uh, like the whole neutrality thing yesterday. I had a little session about that. Um, and just to, you know, stimulate discussion around campus and get people talking and also to promote new services that we have or just like need a need that uh, the university community has um, or something that I'm interested in because I think uh, people should know some, some stuff about what we do. Uh, and then beyond that, there's a lot of other stuff too, believe it or not. Uh, I do a lot of uh, PR around the university, so social media. We have a lot of lectures, I love those. Um, I just done communities to manage all of our electronic resources and like what we buy and we don't buy it when we buy it. Um, and then what else? There's, oh yeah, uh, there's website design. We do a lot of that. Um, so a lot of user testing, a lot of working with students, a lot of working with design theory. Uh, it was pretty big. Um, and then there's just like answering uh, like virtual chat and uh, reference questions. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that I do. I know that's way less than 10 minutes, but I'm way more interested in the questions that you guys have than uh, rambling on about what I do day to day. So I might leave more time for that and move things along. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Will. We will now go to Brooke. It's all yours, Brooke. Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to say I also have an undergrad bachelor's in geography from University of Arizona. So um, Ed and I have that in common. Um, I just have a, a few things about my communities that I've had since I left grad school. I'm in my second position right now. My previous position was just about three and a half miles away and actually our neighboring library distant district. So I'm very familiar with this area and I grew up in Grays Lake, which is also in Lake County. Um, I started in 2008 at Fremont Public Library, which is in Mundelein. It's a suburban community about an hour northwest of Chicago in Lake County. And right when I started, I could tell there were groups of people that I wanted to know more about. I was in the Youth Services Department, and I wanted to know exactly which areas to direct my energy towards, um, what types coming from the community informatics background, where should I be centered on? And this is hard in a new community for anybody. Fortunately, because I was a little bit familiar growing up so close, I had a little bit of knowledge. Um, one of the biggest accomplishments I had in this job, my previous job, was teaching Spanish-speaking adults how to use the computer. Now, this kind of fell into my lap while I was still a children's librarian. I noticed the parents of children in school had never had an email address before. And the teachers were expecting the parents to communicate with them through email. So they would come to the youth department with their children, their school age children and say, how do I email the teacher? She wants to know um, what my daughter's homework is or some, some sort of homework question. Um, these patrons came in with very little knowledge, perhaps only an eighth grade education from their home uh, country and a yearning to learn. So we would meet weekly, first with maybe one mom, and we would set up an email address, and then she'd come back and say, well, how can I check my daughter's lunch schedule? I want to know what she's eating at school, and they don't send it home in paper anymore. We'd do that. And then she kind of spread the word and a couple other adults would come in and we made it a weekly, nightly drop-in Spanish computer help. I had a group of about six or seven regulars um, and I would even make time for people one-on-one. -on -one. 
And they came in with questions like, how do I apply for a job? How do I search for nanny jobs? How can I send pictures to my family? How can I see my family's photos? And how can I practice English for my upcoming citizenship exam? Which we went to YouTube and she sat and listened to the citizenship test questions hours after hours so that she knew what the questions sounded like in English and was able to answer them. And she did pass, so that was amazing. Um, how do I watch TV on the computer or how do I make a letter and print it out? So th those were some of the technology questions I had. All of this came slowly but naturally. It wasn't part of my job description. It did not say save two hours a week for individualized attention to a specific group of people. So that wasn't expected from my boss or anyone else. It just happened. After about five years, this changed into a group of seniors. And I did, between that time, switch departments and moved up into the adult services department, thinking I could have more interaction with adults and more technology in that department. So I started teaching seniors, English-speaking seniors, who in general were very concerned about privacy on the internet. We would spend a long time just talking about what the internet is, how you can be safe, why you don't have to really worry. Um, we ended up speaking more philosophically than technology, but that helps too because they were very nervous about even having an email account. Um, the groups of people I serve are constantly changing, but the thread that keeps them together is that they are community members with a need, and I fulfill it or find a way to help. When more than one person has the same need, an idea is formed, and we start brainstorming. How can we make this part of our public library job? Because lots of people are asking. This could be more commu computer training, more digital media lab tools, or even just more large print books on the shelves to help those readers who need it. How am I on time, Kate? Oh, she's on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Good on time. Okay. Currently in my outreach position, where I'm now at Cook Memorial, the, the library right next to Fremont, I have I serve both seniors, daycares, preschools and schools, and community members. The community members are from all backgrounds, but with a large percentage of Spanish speakers. I am very, very fortunate to have five bilingual employees and six including myself. One of my employees speaks five languages, including Spanish, Urdu, and her father's regional Indian language. I am very lucky that my team is ready and able to meet those patrons where they are. We have a community stop that currently includes a large number of temporary residents from India. These users present a very different set of needs. Most are here for technology-based jobs and are very educated but are craving educational assistance for their children and making sure their children are keeping up with their educational goals. And each group has needs that may vary from each other. These needs may also vary from year to year. We are currently in the mid middle of a survey period and are asking our bookmobile patrons if they would be interested in using Wi-Fi while on the bookmobile. Some have said yes and some have said no. The results of this survey actually differ based on which neighborhood we are in. But these questions will help us plan our future with budget and our monetary goals. Sometimes I am discouraged that I no longer help my six regular Spanish speaking com computer patrons and I miss them. But then I look at all of the new opportunities that have come my way and it's okay. I'm always reflecting on what works or what didn't and going an extra step to listen to the feedback from the community then adjust my next project goals. Every time I analyze what my community needs, I'm practicing community informatics. With Kate and Abdul during grad school and during working for an assistantship, they taught me how to have an analytical approach using data and research to back up that each, each question that presents itself. But at the same time, they always focused on the narrative as well. We can support telling a community story with as much data as possible, 
but painting a picture to the story is just as important. Showing that one patron who came in to use our computers to take a food safety certification course in Spanish, telling his five other friends, who then tell their five other friends, and pretty soon 15 to 20 food safety employees are using our library to take a required course. Those numbers aren't huge, but the path from one person starting to 20 is just as important. The natural word of mouth system is what oftentimes works best. And I hope this background gives a little bit of insight to a library position. And it's true, not all librarians are able to have this much flexibility. But if you start slowly and show how your community is positively benefiting from a program, from a service, even from a handout that you create, things will snowball and eventually the management or the administration will notice how involved you are. And I can't imagine anyone who wouldn't think that that's a positive thing. And that's all I have. <laughs> I don't know if our microphone is moved. Um, that round of applause were for the, for, was for the two of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now let's move to Ed. Thank you very much, Brooke. Okay, hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you, Kate, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I was planning to talk about four assets I developed while studying community informatics that have shaped my trajectory over the past five years. Uh, in order of professional importance, these assets are work experience, technology instruction skills, and eagerness to adapt libraries to social changes and critical social thinking. Now, um, my presentation was originally about 13 minutes, so uh, I'm going to try to telescope the first two, uh, work experience and technology instruction skills, um, simply by saying that through uh, community informatics, I got a research assistantship, uh, I, I was introduced to a future employer at the East Chicago conference, and my practicum, um, my, my field work, uh, actually led to a job and then a series of promotions uh, that then led, led to later positions. So that's probably the most important thing. There's a direct line that can be drawn from my community informatics coursework uh, through public library positions of increasing responsibility and then ending at my current position as a full-time adult librarian with CPL. Um, and then the, the second area is technology instruction skills. And I emphasize not only um, technology skills, but instruction uh, around technology. And again, I think that's something Brooke covered, so, um, so I, I won't dwell on it, but maybe uh, we can come back to it uh, in the discussion, because um, I'm gonna try to keep this at 10 minutes. So um, those are the most practical ways in which community informatics helped me to become a better librarian. And now I want to talk a little bit about something more reflective, uh, perhaps more narrative, adapting to social change and critical social thinking. And so sometimes I'll be talking directly about my work at CPL, and other times I'll be speaking more uh, just as a reflective individual. Um, so I'd, I'd like to begin by considering cyber navigation alongside the concept of the library as the people's university. And I'm actually very ambivalent about the concept of the public library as the people's university. Universities in our society prepare people to get jobs or to get better jobs. Public libraries also offer services and products for free that can add considerable value to individuals as job seekers. And the Cyber Navigator program is a perfect example of this. Um, we should keep in mind, however, that some champions of the public library, perhaps Andrew Carnegie most famously, have promoted the idea of libraries not simply as necessary institutions for job seeking individuals, many of whom are low wage workers and immigrants, as Brooke described, but sufficient institutions for job seekers. And sometimes at, at extremes, the idea is that those who can't find a job or who can't find a better job have no right to complain because after all, society has given them in the form of the public library, all the tools they need to better themselves and pursue the American dream. Uh, Lowell Martin's book, Enrichment, that uh, I, I read as uh, part of Kate's class more recently, uh, cites this bootstrapping ideology as part of the reason why even some of the most conservative municipalities hesitate before slashing public library budgets. Viewed in this light, it may not seem accidental that Carnegie himself was both pro-public library and rabidly anti-labor union, or that the primary funder of the non-union cyber navigator program is Walmart, where wages are kept low in part because of a very large pool of applicants uh, that's competing for scarce jobs. So, Viewed from the point of uh, employers who take for granted a natural rate of unemployment, 
public libraries may be able to offer perfectly sufficient remedies to the plight of job seekers. Um, but after years of sharing job seekers' frustrations, I would argue that even the best services offered by public libraries are insufficient to the problems facing those compelled to sell their labor. And what would a sufficient uh, solution look like, you might ask? Well, that's a deep question, and it does not admit of easy answers. And it's also a political question beyond uh, the purview of this talk today. But I would say that ironically, our, our work with job seekers and libraries rightly so crucial precisely because we can't refer our patrons to a social institution that would guarantee them a job at a living wage. Uh, and such an institution might have been created had our society met the demand for full employment that was central to uh, the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom, uh, among many other historical examples. Um, so what I've said so far suggests that libraries sometimes aim to fill gaps left by other social institutions, uh, actual or potential. I take community informatics to be infused with an adaptive spirit, always seeking ways in which broad social changes, whether desirable or undesirable, might open up new opportunities for libraries. And this spirit animates some of my adult programming work. And I'd like to return to the idea of public libraries as the people's university. Uh, in his essay, The Idea of the University, Jürgen Habermas describes how the sociologist Talcott Parsons attributed four functions to the university, research and training of academic personnel in graduate schools, professional training in pre-professional schools, general education in the college, and a more nebulous fourth function, quote, contributions to cultural self-understanding and intellectual enlightenment, contributions that are addressed in part to the public. Habermas writes that only the fourth function does not have a carrier institution of its own. This is filled by the intellectual role of the professors. And the learning process that the professors facilitate stands at a remove from the purely reproductive functions of the life world, such as career preparation. The purely intellectual preparation that professors provide uh, teaches the mode of scientific thinking, i.e. the adoption of a hypothetical attitude vis-a-vis -vis facts and norms. In addition, going beyond the acquisition of expert knowledge, they offer informed interpretations and diagnoses of contemporary events and take concrete political stands. They contribute to the self-understanding of the sciences within the role, within the whole of culture by supplying theories of science, morality, art, and literature. Uh, writing in 1963, Richard Hofstadter diagnosed one potential obstacle to this uh, uh, very, very nice vision. Uh, anti-intellectualism in American life. The public, Hofstadter wrote, had abandoned the intellectuals who were despised in popular culture as pretentious, confused, and doctrinaire. By the 1980s, Russell Jacobi, in a book titled The Last Intellectuals, diagnosed the reverse social situation. The intellectuals had abandoned the public. Institutionalized as professors, intellectuals traded the vernacular for academic jargon, addressing other specialists at the expense of the broad public. On Jacobi's account, this happened because the institutions that had sustained the role of the public intellectual throughout most of the 20th century, institutions like a thriving print journalism and low rent urban bohemias had been gradually eroded such that by the late 20th century, the university had become the only game in town for intellectuals needing to make a living. Jacobi's account suggests that the university has to a large extent abdicated the public enlightenment function attributed to it by earlier thinkers like Parsons. And it's doubtful that other institutions in our society have stepped in to fill this role. Mass media outlets like NPR or C-SPAN tend at their best to be exceptions to the rule against thinking in public. And the internet, undoubtedly the greatest trove of educated public conversation, is almost always experienced in private, providing no exact replacement. Uh, ultimately, Jacobi later wrote, it is not only the larger public that loses when intellectuals turn inward to fetishize their profundity and remain within their university corridors and offices, but also the intellectuals themselves. So in light of all this, the question I'd like to pose is, can public libraries offer a necessary space, albeit perhaps an insufficient one, where intellectuals committed to a public can find a real life audience and where individuals craving serious thinking can find an informed public conversation? When I began working at Edgewater, I created a monthly event series called Modern Lives and Movements. Each month, we select a different topic and host an interrelated film screening, book discussion, and public event. Usually, that event is a panel, debate, or lecture discussion on that topic. Our past topics have included Bayard Rustin, The Great Migration, Masters and Johnson, The Bauhaus School, Feminism, Isaac Newton, The Rise of Asia, 
the Death with Dignity movement, and the opposition to World War I. The curation has been somewhat lopsided towards political and social history, admittedly, but we're eager to use this series in the future to explore the arts and culture, science, business, really any topic that opens up the big questions of modern life. Nearly all of the events in this series have been successful quantitatively in terms of the number of patrons who attended and participated, including in two cases, uh, perhaps hundreds or thousands of Can TV viewers at home, as well as qualitatively in terms of both the caliber of the films, books, and uh, speakers engaged, uh, as well as the dynamism of patrons' participation and their contributions. Um, we've also earned the consistent praise of attendees for surpassing their expectations of what a public library event can do. A recent presenter wrote to me after an event to say, quote, I must admit I was surprised, perhaps amazed is the right term, by the level of discussion from the audience. It was as sophisticated and interesting as anything I've had teaching at the University of Chicago. It was a superb antidote for a certain snobbery that I hadn't even called into question about public library functions. Uh, we also host debates uh, apart from this series. Last year, we hosted a three-way debate on healthcare reform featuring three doctors. In November, we're going to host a three-way debate over Chicago's minimum wage. And in January, we hope to host an exchange on Israel and Palestine. So these programs with ideas at their center fit into a larger fabric of diverse adult programming that we offer, all the things you would expect. Um, but I mention them here because they share the adaptive spirit, if not always the technology-oriented letter of community informatics, premised on the idea that public libraries can help to fill a social void or meet an unmet social need. Um, I'll conclude very briefly with that fourth asset, critical social thinking. And I could have described this as utopian social thinking because the animating impulse is that our social relations ought to be otherwise, they could have turned out otherwise, and they might yet become otherwise. Uh, I indicated this line of thinking above with my comments about how cyber navigating work raises questions of full employment. Similarly, when I took Kate's class, a lecture by Mike Smeltzer raised the question of how our society should structure high-speed internet access, and this led me to st uh, study Robert McChesney's work on this issue. I was later invited to give a talk at a conference in New York about how problems around copyright and digital access to knowledge and culture similarly suggest that another very different world is possible. This thinking is not always easy to instrumentalize, and it tends to suggest fundamentally political rather than professional solutions or exclusively professional solutions. So it may not have made me a better librarian in, in the very narrow sense, um, but this thinking has certainly made me a more reflective librarian and I think it speaks to Kate's willingness to provide a genuinely intellectual education for her community informatics students. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. Can you still hear us? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I have some startup questions that maybe you all want to get started today with questions to any of our panelists, uh, maybe hold your questions for Will till he gets back. <laughs> I have a question. Okay, be sure you speak up. And why don't you say your name? Yes. Hi, I'm Catherine. Hi. Hi, I was wondering how you got your first job out of library science school. Um, what kind of connections did you make to get those jobs? You can go. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, yeah, that's that's precisely the part I skipped over because I wanted to come in, uh, uh, in, in good time. Um, so, well, actually, the first job I got was when I was still in library science school uh, because that practicum in Kate Williams' class uh, involved me being a sort of assistant instructor um, for computer classes in a computer center, a public library computer center. And on the basis of that sort of volunteer work for, um, for class purposes, they offered me a part-time position as a computer center assistant, sort of staffing the, the desk at the center. And then um, uh, they liked the work I was doing. And, and then when, uh, when, I had my, uh, when I earned my degree at the end of the year, they then promoted me to the sub-adult uh, reference librarian position um, that I was for. So that was one track. I also had a paid research assistantship uh, working for the, uh, a community library uh, affiliated with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in Chicago. Um, but that didn't really lead directly anywhere after, my, uh, after I graduated. Um, but I guess the other perhaps uh, most important thing would be the cyber navigating work. 
And that I actually began after I earned my degree. So I did spend a while um, where only only my sub job was uh, was the job that I held that that required uh, the master's degree. Um, and for between a year and a year and a half, I was working as a cyber navigator after I had earned the degree. Um, but again, that that I got through connections that I made at Gislas and especially at East Chicago. And uh, you know, I, I got that job because uh, th there is a pipeline. I think a very useful pipeline that um, Gislas has created. Uh, from the community informatics program through conferences like East Chicago and then to the um, Chicago Public Library Foundation Cyber Navigator program. Um, so in my case, you know, it really was a success story. Some others waited in the wings for a while and then found positions elsewhere. Um, but I actually did end up then kind of matriculating into a full-time CPL position. And I kind of went the old-fashioned way of sending out applications to probably 20 different places. This was 2008, right when the economy was not doing so well. Um, and with the youth services position, I offered to do a Spanish story time and that's what kind of sold my manager. So, um, it all came down to one thing they were looking for, and um, she she hired me. But it wasn't really connections at that point from school, although the degree helped and all of my experience helped. Um, but it was the sending off applications and following up, making a great cover letter, et cetera. But that, that little thing that they were looking for, and you never know exactly what the one thing they really want because they may not be able to to um, fully put that in words on the application, but you may impress them with one sentence in the interview and you have the job, so. I was able to other position and then people I think you're oh yeah we can't understand you because <laughs> um, he's using auto tune the problem with the connection well maybe if you turn off your video but leave your audio on maybe your audio would come through clearer if you could try just turning off your video and leaving the audio on is there a lot of yeah. <laughs> Where are you? yeah well you could also text you could also type in your the the, the, the chat feature at the bottom of the screen you may if, if we can't get the audio working you may try just uh typing or is there a way we could call in? Um, I mean, yeah, you can also call in from your smartphone. If you have a smartphone, um, I think maybe even just a regular phone, there's a number in the email I sent you. You could also try calling in, getting off your computer and calling in. Um, if you check the email I sent you inviting you to the Zoom meeting, you can also call in. You might not be able to hear us. Yeah. Yeah. Like text and call. I think I think we should keep going, and if you can find a channel to talk to them in the meantime okay. to pull them back in, that'd be good. Um, other questions, comments? Yeah, why don't you go next to me? Um, so I have a question. My name is Christina. Um, so I've worked with places um, like around here, like the Orpheum Children's okay. Museum, um, where you have a pretty you know pretty steady flow of kids coming in and doing events. Um, and one of the, the issues is that it's hard to assess the efficacy of your event because you have that steady stream and you can't longitudinally follow um, a lot of your uh, students or your participants. Um, so what do you guys do to assess the efficacy to be able to inform your future programs? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think the fact that they are attending. I, we always use attendance as a measurement. Um, if it's a low attending program, we rethink it or 
decide to try something else. Um, if they keep coming back, that's usually a sign that they are taking something out of it. Um, I haven't, besides attendance and feedback, verbal feedback, I haven't had any other formal tools of assessing. Um, after a while, you just kind of get a feeling. <laughs> I know that's, that's not very helpful, but um, they, because you can take one person's opinion and you're not going to change your whole program just based on, on one opinion, but you keep that in the back of your mind and plan accordingly for the next event. But I think in the public library, that is our biggest uh, measurement. They are really concerned about circulation and attendance and visitors. So in that sort of program where you're already having visitors, um, I think that's that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, actually, my, my response is, is largely the same. Um, and and I, it, it does raise some anxiety because I think, you know, your question hits a bit of an Achilles heel. Um, not necessarily right now, but potentially. Um, because there always is that question, right, of, you know, if, if the system changes priorities, if um, you know, there's new management that that wants to see, see things go in a different direction. Um, how do you prove that the work you did um, was was worth doing? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, again, in in my experience, um, it's it's been largely the same. We we haven't uh, other than attendance, there hasn't been a whole lot of quantitative measurement that we've done. Although I have thought um, about uh, making surveys to give after each event. Um, we talk a lot with our patrons. I mean, my, I, I think a lot of libraries are like this actually where, you know, the, the folks that come to the events, they're, they're happy to talk to you about what they liked and what they didn't. And so a lot of that conversation takes place between the staff and the patrons and then among the staff. Um, we had one event that I was ready to write off as a failure because we had a professor come and give a lecture about Isaac Newton and his world and only 10 people showed up. And uh, my manager actually stayed for the event and I said, oh, you know, after I, I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry, like I was hoping that would be bigger. You know, this was kind of a long shot. It's an obscure topic. Only 10 people came up and she said, well, what are you talking about? We had one, one, one of our community partners came and she said that her, uh, her husband had attended the event and literally couldn't sleep that night because he was so, uh, he was so sort of engaged in the topic and he was just reading and learning more, you know, after the event. So, on paper, that's just one more person, right? Um, but I think my manager was right to say, no, that's, that's, um, that's an important mark of, of the event's success. It's, it's more narrative and, and qualitative. Um, but you're right, and that's something that's always sort of haunting me, like how will, how, will we, uh, how will we put the numbers behind all of this? It's a good question. I want to add, I, I hope Will can speak to this question of, of measuring success with, with events and other kinds of services, but I want to offer something up, and that is that community informatics, as you all will see as the readings unfold in the semester, and you're beginning to see it already, looks at communities as networks of people. And I think a social network approach to this uh, really is nothing but record sheeting is part of what builds up the data and the stories that then make a strong case for whatever it is you're doing and their, the results that they get. So all the things that they have talked about, attendance, then is there an attendance sheet? So you can see the repeat customers and you know their names. The people who come to and say nice things about the program, like that story about someone who couldn't sleep because they were up all night reading more online about Isaac Newton, that's a story that needs to be saved somewhere even if it's in a, in, a, in a diary that you keep, so that you can then assemble these stories because they have pile up over time. And so a social networking working approach to, to community work and also excellent record keeping, whether it's digital or paper, because you, nothing like sending around a sign-up sheet around the room and making sure that it goes around the room. Any further thoughts on that, Will, from you since you're back about how to, how to measure success of various library programs? Sure. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so measuring success is, is very relative and very tricky. 
Um, and there's nothing better than like a really good set of data or a good way to capture data. But that's uh, never ever the reality. So I think it's incumbent upon us uh, as clever community informaticists to kind of read between the lines and see data from places that you might not necessarily always find it. And so I always, I mean, whenever I teach, I try to solicit for feedback from the people who take the class, but I also try to solicit for feedback from people who could be taking the class instead. Oh, I think we're there's a beginning of some ideas there. <laughs> good. Well, yeah, I guess I'll just pick up that thread briefly. Our patrons have given us useful feedback about how to structure our events, um, and that's important as well. Um, one, for example, uh, one recent suggestion we got is that we should structure our adult book discussions by having each person bring a question. And then that person uh, raises their question at the beginning, and then we spend a, a certain amount of time um, all addressing each other's questions uh, uh, in order. And that's something that we're going to try out for our next discussion. We'll see how it goes. Um, but, you know, it's a patron suggestion that um, we thought might be a useful one. Thanks. All right, y'all. We've got Ed still standing. Well, I actually have a question for Ed. This works out great. Um, I actually lived in Edgewater for a year before, right after undergrad, and I, my best friend still lives there now. And I had heard about these discussions that you speak of, and they sound like they would be ridiculously awesome for both me and her. But it's like, how do you go about, two questions actually, how do you go about advertising these services, you know, not these services, these programs, so that way people, not just people who go into the library, but people who don't, wouldn't normally come into the library would get to, you know, partake in this. And then also a random side question about the possibility of adult volunteers in the CPL library, just because I feel like, yes, you're giving things out to the community, but in what ways are you looking for community members to be able to contribute to the library? Yeah, very good questions. The first one, um, I, I, I'm glad we only have two, uh, two feet, uh, because <laughs> that's, that's the other Achilles heel of my work probably, is uh, advertising. Um, so it's a very good question, and it's something I've thought about a lot, um, because you're right. Um, some of these programs have been very well advertised. Um, for example, we had John D'Amelio give a talk on Bayard Rustin on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And that one went out in the press and you know, it got a lot of coverage and we got TV coverage and that sort of thing. But others, um, you know, admittedly one problem is that, and, and it's something that I probably could do better, but it's also something that there's probably an upper limit to how much better I could do it. Um, but I could probably do it at least a little better, is just um, advanced planning and making sure that, you know, we're not planning the next month's event series, um, you know, only six weeks before it takes place. Because the reality is with so many demands on our time, that's how it often happens. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there are ways to improve that. That's actually one of the things that I'm going to speak with my manager about um, in, in my upcoming review, is that I'd like to make sure that we're not um, hiding our light under a bushel basket, so to speak, because um, you're absolutely right. Um, on the other point, um, there we've had more success. Um, one example, so, so on, on people, on, on adults volunteering and contributing to the library in that capacity, um, I'll mention two things. One is that the speakers we have, um, and I feel very ambivalent about this, again, because I think it speaks to lot larger social failures, but our speakers are almost always volunteer speakers. We, we don't really have money uh, to give as honoraria. And, and to the extent that we have, it's been a token gesture, like $25, you know, and, and only in very rare cases. Um, so this is a way in which people are volunteering their time and, and their efforts and their expertise and their learning, um, you know, to contribute to things that are happening at the library. Um, and some, some writers and, and, and intellectuals have, have actually tried to protest this model that intellectual labor should be done for free. And I'm very sympathetic to that, although, um, you know, the, the prevailing social trends are very much in the opposite direction. And intellectual work, as I suggested, is very precarious today. Um, also, I think sometimes people just realize that it's, it's part of their, it's a labor of love to share their learning. Um, with others, and so they might not feel like exploited wage slaves <laughs> when they come and give a free talk at the library. They might feel that they're serving a larger public function. So there should be a space for that. Um, secondly, more practically, um, 
uh, we have a Friends of the Library group that's very active. And uh, in CPL, um, whatever you think about this, there, there are things to be said positively and negatively for it. But um, the, the core library work is protected by the union. So you can't have adult volunteers come in and do things that are in the job descriptions of, um, of, of, uh, of, of unionized CPL staff. But what you can do is set up Friends of the Library groups where people can do things like fundraising and community support and that sort of thing. And it's through that, for example, that we were able to purchase a, a movie license that allows us to screen um, uh, a, a lot of popular movies. So that's important. And, and, and we really rely on our volunteers in that respect. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Do either of you, Will or Brooke, want to speak to that question? Can you repeat um, the question? Oh. oh, sure. So there were two questions. One is how do you go about advertising or marketing the great programs and things that the libraries offer? But then also in what ways do you engage with the community so that they can contribute to the library through like volunteering or what have you, as opposed to just constantly getting things from the library? Thanks, Brooke, did you? No, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, so to answer your second question first, uh, I, I kind of support, a, I do support a model in all of my classes and instruction sessions for uh, peer-driven content. And it's really rare that I, uh, I talk a lot. It's, it's mostly student-driven. Um, and it's based around the questions that students have, inquiry-based learning. Um, I use that as a model. And I also always solicit from professors, from community members, from different student groups to represent the needs of the different populations within these uh, instruction sessions. And only the, the more formalized classes do I follow any sort of script or adhere to any sort of uh, rules that I didn't make up with the, the students that I'm working with. So it's, it's a huge emphasis of mine to make sure that everything's peer driven and student driven. Um, and then I, I do a lot of promotion myself. Like I said, I do a lot of PR. I've done social media work before. Um, but when, when, I, when push comes to shove, there's a lot of just like going to different faculty offices uh, and promoting it yourself, making posters, getting the word out there on your own because you know, people that come, you, you've got to carry that weight yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we, do, we are not in a union, so we don't have the volunteer problem, but we do not have a paid volunteer coordinator, which from what I've observed, necessary to organize the volunteers. Um, the library I used to work at did have a volunteer coordinator and had oh, probably 100 to 200 adults volunteering every day. So they had a great example. Um, advertising is hard. I think it works best. Um, the newsletter that's sent home, word of mouth, social media, doing not only work-related social media, but having fun with it as well to get people to actually follow the library. Um, and we're in the, the midst of deciding whether or not we want to take on a volunteer corps which would probably become part of my position, um, becoming more of a community engagement librarian, which different public libraries around Chicago have those titles, and allowing a patron to create their own volunteer position. So they would come to us first with their skills and we would find a place for them rather than the library saying, oh, we need 10 people to come shelve DVDs. Um, we would have people say, I used to be a teacher. Can I help out with story times? Sure, we'll put you together with one of our youth librarians and you can shadow them for a few weeks and maybe do one on your own. Um, so that is kind of in the works. One of the reasons I thought of this is there we have eight senior centers in our district, nursing homes. Or some of them are independent, some are assisted living. One of them is very um, severe patients of Alzheimer's. So it's hard to do programming that is effective. The same type of programming with seniors that are um, still very much 
thinking and within in the area of understanding a, a program would not work at that place. But I had a volunteer, I had a friend who said, I would love to just go read to them. I would read children's stories. I would read historical novels or short pieces. And I thought, why not? That, that's something that would help those patrons that we don't have staff time or money to spend on that right now. Um, but a volunteer in the community who has a passion for that, I would absolutely support them and say she is here on behalf of our library and she's here to give your residents whatever they may need, meet them at their level. So. I think we have time for one more question or comment. Yeah. Hi, I'm Haley. Uh, my question is, how did studying community informatics at Gisless uh, influence your thinking on your role as a librarian and also helping the communities that you serve? What, what was that last part? Uh, how did the community informatics influence your thinking about how you, your role as a librarian and also your role um, in working with the communities that you serve? I can start. Uh, so, in the day to day of any job, there's uh, like a million things that you have to do, at least uh, well, in every position that I've ever had. Uh, and it's really easy to get bogged down and caught up in those things. And for me, on a personal level, a lot of like the, the theory and a lot of the experience I had through all my community informatics classes does a really good job of uh, grounding me and making sure that I'm focused on these larger, bigger picture ideas uh, so that the little tiny menial tasks don't eat me up. And I know that they're like stepping stones to a larger ideal. So an example of that is uh, we're trying to revamp our information literacy standards at Loyola right now, and we're trying to kind of put together uh, a more comprehensive set of sessions, set of uh, education modules for the whole community. And it's a very slow process. It's gonna take a really long time, but it's gonna be worth it, and it's gonna be really comprehensive and really progressive and very exciting, and cover a lot of ground and reach a lot of people that we don't reach already. And so every time I do a session, I try to work in you know, one element of this, or I try to talk about the program to a dean or to a provost or to somebody higher up just to kind of plant those bugs in, in their ears. And without having uh, a community informatics background, it'd be easy to forget that there's all of the stuff that needs to happen, even if it's at a slower pace. Uh, and then the other way it influences everything is, is when I'm teaching or when I'm speaking, uh, it kind of frames where I start speaking and where I am speaking. And when I, and when I listen to others, it's, it's kind of just like a very fundamental level of, of how I interact with everybody on a daily basis, if that makes sense. I think um, it made me think outside the box, I guess, and think of the groups of people that are sometimes left behind or left out of the bigger picture um, and looking at and little projects that um, at the time may not seem like a big deal to the community as a whole, but it's a very important piece of information, whether it's archiving or helping out at a certain um, museum or a certain center, it helps that particular community and then that in turn helps the community at large and it brings more awareness to people who may not have thought about, um, you know, the Alzheimer's Center down the street. Maybe, maybe no one even knows about that. So I think just looking at the, the pockets of communities, but also how those individual different groups can be added together and make, um, make a difference in a whole community. Um, that's what's helped me. And also looking at things with almost a research-based mind helps because that helps you sell it to the administrators um, down the road and kind of making sure you have what they want, how this will help them because they always kind of have a different set of goals in mind than the people on the ground. So translating what your community needs into making sure your administration knows why this is important is also a good skill. 
Yeah, I would echo uh, some of what has been said. Um, in, in my presentation, I think I tried to emphasize how I think community informatics is premised on the idea that when you look at broad social changes, uh, this allows you to take a kind of experimental approach to how libraries might play different roles in, in adapting to or responding to these changes. Um, and I think at the core of community informatics, including, um, and, and you can see this in um, uh, the, the book that Kate was involved in in the 1990s, the Job Tech book, um, at the core, I think, has been changes around um, public computing and its implications. Um, but as I tried to show, I think that kind of general principle um, can be applied um, even more widely. Um, and I think, so, so that's how I see it as having impacted my, my work as a librarian, how I see the role. I guess the other thing, just to echo what Kate had mentioned before, is um, the importance of being a kind of uh, Rolodex, so to speak, you know, the social networks, the social capital. Um, when right now at the library, when we want to do something on, uh, on agriculture, if we want to do something on the environment, if we want to do something on economics, um, on politics, on social history, on art, architecture, um, because of the programs we've done in the past, we now have people and organizations that we can contact to kind of build an audience. Um, psychology, actually, is another one. We've had really interesting engagements there. Um, so, so we gradually, over time, accumulate uh, these, these contacts with um, organizations and individuals, and um, this really helps us to build and develop and sustain a conversation over time. Um, and without us, that wouldn't happen. Um, you need someone there to consistently sort of bring, bring people together um, in, in a common structure. What a beautiful note to end on, you all. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you all. You all, I, I don't know if the students here noticed, but I thought that we, you all represented the reality behind the readings that we read the first two hours of the day. <laughs> see you all in a week, and uh, look to see you all again soon, too. And thanks again. All right, thank you. Bye.